Many believe 1897 to be the year the collective consciousness was introduced to vampires. Irish writer Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula, would introduce us to the suave yet serious count of the same name. Vampires burst onto the gothic horror scene as well-dressed, charismatic rogues. By the end of Dracula, you understand why Dracula has to die, but can't help but feel a bit bad for him. Since 1897, the image of the vampire in popular culture hasn't changed too terribly much. They're suave, debonair, devil-may-care types, as likely to mesmerize with their charming good looks as they are to drain you of your blood completely. Bram Stoker did not invent the vampire. The vampires that came before Dracula were of a different sort. Beastly, dangerous things, which terrorized villages and struck fear into the hearts of the people of the Middle Ages. A recent excavation in Poland is just one example of the links people would go to to rid their lives of the vampire. A team from Nicholas Copernicus University, during an excavation of a grave site in Pien, outside of Krakow, Poland, discovered a strange grave. It was a woman's skeleton, wearing a gold-threaded cap, with a sickle laid across her throat. There was also a padlock around her left big toe. These burial rituals are not unheard of, but this is the most recent case of a vampire burial. Myths and legends about blood-sucking fiends were not uncommon in 17th century Poland. In fact, many historians believe that Poland suffered a kind of vampire epidemic around that time. Polish vampires, as I stated before, are nothing like the pop culture, cape-wearing sex symbols of modern literature and film. They did not sparkle in the sunlight, and they certainly didn't care about random Victorian women. As Slavic folklore expert Kazmierz Mozinski put it in the 1930s, quote, Whatever the Slavs claim about these half-demonic creatures, it is filled with unbound savagery. I explain all of this so you know just how scary the concept of a Polish or Slavic vampire is. The Slavic vampire myth was so radically different from what we are used to that it almost seems completely unrelated. Bodies inhabited by their restless ghost rise from the grave and return to their family home to viciously maul and eat their closest family members. There is no theatricality, no round rimmed sunglasses, and definitely nothing sexy about this. Anyone could become a vampire, but a few signs were an almost guarantee that you'd get a vampire burial. If you had teeth at birth, you were a vampire. If you had two sets of teeth, vampire. Unibrow, that's a vampire. In those times, any physical deformity could mark you as a future member of the undead. Bodies were treated roughly after death to prevent them coming back as one of the undead or Yupirsh. Practices like smashing the deceased head in with a rock or removing their arms, legs, and head. Other bodies were buried face down, their jaws forced open to bite into the dirt. At least one other recorded vampire burial site had multiple instances of a scythe being buried over the dead's throat. The thinking was, if the body decided to suddenly sit up, the scythe would quickly decapitate them, stopping the problem before it even started. The padlock on the big toe, many believe, symbolizes the completion of the cycle and locks the dead from coming back now that their cycle is done. So what could have compelled the people who interred this body to assume they were dealing with an honest-to-goodness Yupirsh? It actually appears as though the skeletal remains answer that question. In this picture, notice the protruding front tooth. 
That may have been all it took to designate this woman all through her life as a future member of the undead. There is a lot to be said about how people with deformities were treated in the eras leading up to today, and this is just one example of the intolerance they faced in life and maybe even in death. But what do you think? Is this an honest to goodness vampire or another example of an outdated bit of folklore run amok? Let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Dread Unsolved. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you enjoy this content, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.